Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Vaughn Sigmund, who is actually just up the coast in Long Beach, California. How are you doing, Vaughn? I'm fantastic. Thank you for asking, John. Yeah, and Vaughn's co-founder of Results Driven Leadership, not your average leadership expert, is the co-founder of Results Driven Leadership and former CarMax executive. He knows what it takes to be a high-impact leader and manager. His coaching and training program, programs provide common sense advice and direction based on real-world experience. So no wonder that CarMax, the country's largest and most respected company in the auto industry, is a 100 best places to work. And what we're going to talk about today is results to improve leadership skill, the biggest mistakes sales leaders make and how to avoid them. And I guess here's the, the starting point, um, Vaughn, is we don't always associate sales leadership and leadership. You know, they, they, we tend to put them in different buckets, and that's often because we don't really invest or train or help our, 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 our sales leaders because often they uh, come into the role by being the best salesperson, not by being the best leader. That's correct. And uh, But that same scenario takes place with most people who end up in being promoted to management. Mm -hmm. They were the greatest at whatever they were doing, so they obviously are going to be great managers as well. And that's where very often the wheels start coming off of their leadership and management effectiveness is they've, they've missed some key elements of how to go perform at a high level in their new role or new position. They, they're great salespeople. They were a great forklift operator, whatever, mm -hmm. um, because you're one or the other does not automatically set you up for a, a natural ability to be a sales leader or a management leader. There is some level of knowledge that has to be obtained in order to be highly effective and get, get out of your team what is expected of you to get out of your team. And, and, and let me just, you know, without yeah. belaboring the point, John, no matter what business we're in, we're in the people business. Very often we miss that fact from a, a knowledge sharing standpoint of being able to provide the knowledge, skills and tools someone needs in order to be effective in this people business. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that makes some sense. Yeah, no, it, 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 total, it makes total sense. And it's one of those things that I think uh, we failed as, as, as most companies have failed over the years is to, is to show how people can have a good career path that doesn't necessarily mean managing people because not everybody is good at it and it's not the right path. But we set it up as that is the only path to promotion or to, to you know, that's, we've set that up as the ultimate goal. That's true. That's true. And, um, you know, there's several steps in between. Mm -hmm. There's a training opportunity. There's a mentorship opportunity. There's there's other paths that somebody go without can go without the title of manager or leader, but it's it's understanding one one has to understand that there are paths, how to achieve those paths, and again where the miss comes off is we often put somebody into that role without all the steps they needed to acquire or achieve prior to being in that role. And back when I was running CarMax, we had three steps before somebody could move from sales into sales management. Mm -hmm. And they were all leadership development type roles. It was warming them up to be an effective leader. Not everybody made it, frankly. Yep. Most did. We, we, we made sure we did whatever it took to give them the, the tools they needed to, to get there, but not everybody made it. But they had to not only learn it, they had to exhibit the skills required to be effective in that role. So, for example... We were always hiring new salespeople who in the in, in a big sales organization isn't constantly mm. hiring salespeople. I think when I I left CarMax, retired from CarMax in 2014, I had north of a thousand salespeople on my team. And uh, about uh, probably 100, 107, I think was the number of sales managers. But we were constantly hiring salespeople. So um 
we were always behind because of our organic mm -hmm. growth. There was this influx of salespeople. Somebody had to make sure they were effective. One sales manager managing 20 or 30 other responsibilities could not put enough yeah. effort into a new salesperson to set them up for success. So we had a mentor role. And that mentor role, if you think about it, is a really great first step for somebody to become a sales leader because you have to be a, an effective coach to be effective in sales leadership. Mm -hmm. And this gets them all set up to bring somebody along because um, there's there's more to selling than just being able to talk. Yeah, anybody who knows anything about sales certainly has to embrace that or knowing your product. There's the, there's an art and a science involved in it. And it was these mentors job to be able to take this raw person who may or may not have sold before. Uh, they certainly haven't sold cars. We never hired anybody from the car world. Right, right. Um, and give them our process. We had a very defined process, teach them the process. Then more importantly, how to apply that process effectively, observe them, coach them. And the success of these new salespeople reflected on the success of the potential growth of this mentor. We knew, the mentor knew, the salespeople knew that, that this person was being effective or not effective. Right. It was a great first step. Yeah, and what I love about that, uh, Bon, is as you as you mentioned, is most people don't know how to coach. Most people's experience of coaching the last time was I don't know, their football coach screaming at them the sideline or or whatever. And and this is this is the key role is learning how to coach. And coaches, as you know, coaching is not telling; it's not directing. It's it's a real skill. So the the process that you've outlined there. Um, setting them up for mentors. So learning coaching first before moving into that is, is incredibly important. Yeah, and so many organizations just completely miss that as a step. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and coaching, as you as you said so eloquently, is is a skill set. And yes, I had football coaches and baseball coaches and they could very often train me on certain skills. Very few of them were very good coaches. Mm -hmm. when, it, when you look at what an effective coach does, which asks a lot of questions, yeah. helps people learn to think versus telling them what to think. You have to help them learn to, to form their own ideas and thoughts and opinions and approaches to things, which comes through a Socratic approach of asking questions. That has to be taught. Yeah. That has to be learned and applied, and some people are far better at it than others. No, no, and absolutely. And then, I mean, then there's the whole part of kind of you have to kind of retrain, uh, as, as especially a top performing salesperson, especially if they're used to always is winning and closing and all of that, because their natural instinct is going to be, especially in the early days of their sales leadership, is going to be jump in, parachute in at the end, and help get stuff over the line, which is demoralizing for the salesperson and it's not what the sales manager should really be. Sales leader. Okay, you're, you're setting them up for failure that way. I've come to save the day. Uh, it is, it, and let me also make a lot of your listeners mad right now. I want to do that, okay? So this is, this is a warning. It is rare that a great salesperson ever made a great sales manager. Mm -hmm. I'll let that sink in. That was a pregnant pause. <laughs> Our average salespeople made great sales managers. Our average salespeople had the heart of a teacher. They had a different disc profile. You know, I use disc very extensively in, in my services, in my practice. And understanding the right disc profile for a, a sales manager versus a great salesperson, there's a there's a big difference there because a, for example, a high S on the disc scale is a much better coach. They're more empathetic. They're more giving. They're more about other people than they are themselves. Most highly successful salespeople are super DIs, which are very selfish. They're very self-centered. They're very ego-driven. I love that in my great salespeople. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I'm not, yeah, hell, I'm one of them. Uh, <laughs> so I get it. But there is, um, there is a very different profile to an individual that's 
highly effective in sales leadership or sales management. And we studied this mm -hmm. and we understood that very rarely was a great salesperson, a great sales manager for the very fact that you just noted. They, they have one way, their way, and they believe because of their, their success with that way, and they're not misplaced, they were successful. They want everybody to do it their way. This is how I do it. And that in sales, again, there's the art to selling. There's an art to leadership. One size does not fit all. And many of these highly achieving salespeople moved into a sales management role or applying a, a, a bat to a pole mm -hmm. in the way of trying to train somebody or bring somebody along. And they're the receiver of that bat against their head, trying to uh, trying to teach them a, a, an improved skill set starts tuning that out mm -hmm. because it doesn't work for them. Yeah. And so that's the yeah. that's, that's, that's nuance. Yeah. And there's another part to it too, Vaughn, if you think about it, like a lot of people, and this definitely goes for a lot of uh, high performing salespeople are what we would call unconsciously competent. They're really good. But they can't really tell you. Yeah, they'll tell you what they do. But in essence, they can't really tell you what they do in order to be good. Therefore, for them to actually train somebody else to do what they do, they can't really do it because they don't actually really know it themselves. And that may sound a bit crazy, but it actually research has shown a lot of them are unconsciously competent. Very, very much so. And, and you, you, this applies in many yeah. different fields. You, you know, the, the probably the most glaring example of this is Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. Michael Jordan, of course, maybe the, the greatest of all time, right? But he was a horrible coach. He was an even worse uh, team owner <laughs> because he is he is he has such natural competencies of being able to pick that apart unpack that to your words, turn that into some instructional mm -hmm. approach to getting others to learn what came naturally to him is damn near impossible. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And and the thing at the end of the day anyway is you don't want everybody to be exactly the same anyway. Yes, you want them to have certain skills and you want them to have, uh, you know, benchmarks and you don't want them all to be the same because let's face it, customers aren't the same, the segments aren't the same, vertical aren't the same. Yeah, there's there's different inputs that re, that result in the output, mm -hmm. and yes, there's different behaviors. Behaviors create the results, but different people are much more uh, adept at at different behaviors that will drive to this to a maybe a better or the same, if not better, outcome. One size does not fit all once again, and they have to find their style, their approach. They're comfortable. We have to play to our strengths. Mm -hmm. Very often the misplaced effort goes into trying to fix one's weaknesses. And I'm never a proponent of that. I don't know what your opinion on that oh. is, John, but it's you, you just can't fix weaknesses. God put them in us <laughs> for a reason. <laughs> Yeah, I I know I'm I'm 100 percent with you on that. It's one of my soapbox ones because if you think about it, most people's experience of annual performance reviews is like, and I I'm sorry for any of you I repeat this all the time, but it's like, hey Vaughn, uh, great review. Uh, here's two things you did really well like, this year, and here's 52 things that you did badly, and I want you to improve on all of them. And and I agree with you. The point is like, why are we not focusing on on the things that you're really good at, making sure you do more of them? Because guess what? never going to be any good at the things that you're really weak at. I mean, that's just a fact. Yeah. And, and, and if you try to be, you're going to yeah. get frustrated. You're going to get stressed out and it makes you even less effective than you were before. So the, if you can leverage one's strengths and create a higher power from those, it'll always overcome the weaknesses yeah. if you've got the right person in, yeah. in place. And I guess that's another challenge for for sales leaders and leaders in general. I mean, and this is a hard thing, I think, for most people as they move through um, leadership ranks is that people are going to do things differently than you. You may not think it's the greatest way of doing it, but if they get the results and if they're consistent and all, then you need to, and it's not disruptive in any way, then you need to be more open-minded and support nuance uh, and and allow people 
to do things the way they want to do them, if that's, you know, as long as you're getting the results. And as I said, it's not disruptive. But that's a really tough thing to do sometimes, is, is to just, especially in the early days, just to hold on to them and say, no, I'm not going to interfere. I'm not going to tell them to do it my way. And you know how many times I've been wrong when I've been biting my my, my tongue? And, oh, my God, they're about to blow this thing. And all of a sudden, it worked. Mm -hmm. that, that really worked. Maybe I don't know everything. <laughs> yeah, well. Who knew? As I always say to my 18-year-old son, is like, well, I'm too old to know everything. So. <laughs> it's funny how that works. I yeah. agree. So, um, so what is it, what is one other area that you would really focus in on that you think uh, to make the most effective sales leader? So, you know, going back to a point I made earlier, no matter what business we're in, yeah. we're in the people business, and knowing how to identify, choose the right individual that's going to be successful in sales, that's where some of the the art comes in in that many, many, many great salespeople made a sales manager have never been trained, instructed on how to interview mm -hmm. and choose onboard new salespeople. And there are certain behavioral patterns, uh, skills that one has to have to be successful in sales. What are they? Okay, I've got to identify those. I got. I have to understand what my standards, what I'm looking for before I go looking for them. Most most sales managers wing it. They're yep. doing it from a gut. They're doing it from a feel, and that, that's okay. You're going to get some right. You're going to get a whole lot more right if you go through a process. Once I identify what I'm looking for in the way of behavior, skill sets, things. Once again, that God either either gave us or didn't. What, mm -hmm. How we're wired, right? And you can't change it after about the age of 23. Um, once I understand that, then I have to identify the right questions to be able to uncover whether they are effective or are skilled, or if that is in fact a strength or a weakness of theirs. And that is a behavior-based interview approach. You know, tell me about a time, you know, share with yeah. me the time, um, get them to start telling stories, which will give you much deeper knowledge about it's not so much. Did they use a CRM? How did they use their yeah. CRM? Exactly. Right. And, you know, that's what makes success. Not that they did. You know, so many times we, we fall under the very wrong assumption that just because somebody has experience someplace else, they're going to be very good here. Yeah, yeah. yeah biggest mistake ever right so it's it's learning those nuances a choice of how to design find identify the best fits for your company your product your services that in the end you're not wasting all your coaching effort on somebody that's never going to get it yeah and you mentioned something interesting earlier about the fact with Carmack that you didn't hire previous auto sales people, right? Uh, and I think that's an important, and I just wanted to come back to that for a moment because oftentimes we see people default to, I prefer to get somebody who's been in our industry, even if they're not very good, than having to find somebody outside and train them all because it's too hard. It's much better that they come from the industry. So just give me your briefly why you didn't, why you did that the other way around. Yeah, so we learned early on that, that the skill set that made someone successful in the traditional car business did not transfer to how we approach business. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a valuable lesson for almost anybody that's hiring for almost any role, but we're talking about salespeople here. Yeah. There's been so much disappointment that I've seen in my clients. They come to me, they're 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 fairly down on themselves. They can't figure out how to get the right people into their architecture to be successful. And we're hiring all these great people from all these great companies. Why aren't they successful here? And they we have to back them up and understand what's going to make them successful. And I've never ever in forty plus years, John, fired somebody because of their lack of experience. Mm. It's been because they lacked a skill set or a behavior. Mm -hmm. Everybody I've, I've failed has been because of some behavioral issue. And so that experience does never guarantee that. And we 
they have to reverse that hierarchy of, of um, uh, priorities, if you right. will, yeah. who I'm looking for is I've got to find the right person. If they bring some experience, great. But all the experience in the world, if they're the wrong fit for you as a leader, mm -hmm. You as your as your client base or your, your targeted customer or your product or service, if they're a, they're an ill fit for that, they're never going to be successful. But we spend much more time. Tell me about what you did at your old job <laughs> versus who you are. Yeah, 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 exactly. And what was that? And just one quick question: um, of all the salespeople that you hired there, what was the most surprising one coming from a very surprising background? Oh my God, I love this story. Thank you for asking this for us. I was actually taken over uh, as part of my training to be an RVP with CarMax. I had to actually run a location and I'd gone through all these months of training and they gave me my first location, which was a dealership in Orlando, Florida. And it was a big one, uh, one of the biggest in the country. And it's my first day. I'm walking through and I'm glad handing with everybody, introducing myself, being Mr. Mr. Friendly and outgoing. And I, I see this one gentleman standing over to the side and he's not making eye, eye contact other than with the toe of his shoe. And, you know, I'm like, you know, who's this guy? He's got it. He's got the right uniform on, but he's does not have the right behavior that is exhibiting. And I finally I work my way through 20 or 30 salespeople and I, I get over to this young man. And I introduced myself and his name's John. And again, John is, he's not making eye contact. He's, he's very nervous. And, I, but I'm, I'm asking John, you know, how long you've been with us? Been with us seven years. Oh, great. How long you've been selling cars? He says, my first day. Well, great. What did you do with CarMax before you sold cars? And he says, I was the truck driver. Oh, John. In my head is, oh, I'm going to find the idiot that made this decision. <laughs> he and I or she and I are going to have a discussion. This is the worst decision I've ever heard somebody make. They took the freaking truck driver and made them a salesperson. Mm -hmm. How is that ever going to work out? Well, it worked out, John. It worked out quite well for both John and CarMax <laughs> because what John was, what I missed, what many people missed is, just because John was a truck driver, he was a little shy, a little introverted, did not mean that John was not going to be effective at our sales approach. Right. This may not work in a lot of sales environment, but it worked very well in our sales environment, which was a very defined sales process. You said this, you did that, you took him here, you walked over here, you asked this question, you did that. It was very defined. And John was very good at following that process, applying that process, which we knew worked. And John just worked the process, worked the process, worked the process. And, he, you know, we had... Um, we had a president's club there, which you had to sell more than 15 cars a month and, in order to qualify for that. And it came with all kinds of nice benefits, mm -hmm. including the pay. John, within his first eight months, made it into president's club. He was in the top 10 out of probably 85 salespeople month after month after month. He never said a word. He never asked a question. He was the most low maintenance salesperson <laughs> anybody's ever worked with. He just took his customer, walked him through the process, did exactly what we trained him to do. And voila, out popped a sale. It was amazing. And I learned a very valuable lesson from that. Yeah, yeah. Don't judge a book by its cover. And it's not one size fits all. There are people who find mysterious ways <laughs> to be successful in sales. Yeah. And, and it's not typical. I love it, Vaughn. So some of the what, viewers and listeners are probably just be searching through Orlando trying to find him now and hire him. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Great, great story. Listen, fantastic insights, Vaughn. All of Vaughn's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Well, I, I, I'm the co-founder of Results Driven Leadership. We, we, we work with companies who are looking to provide their leadership teams, both in sales and management and executive level, the knowledge, skills and tools to be able to lead, perform, get the results they're looking for, be a high impact manager within that organization. We work on the sales side. We work on the management side. We work on the strategy side. We work on the alignment side. We work very deeply into the 
the hiring side of the business. A big part of our, our business is in disc assessments. We believe that the science behind that is very effective. And if you want to up your game in hiring anybody, you need to talk to us because we can teach you a better way than what you're doing now. Yeah, and because I tell you, Yvonne, here's something I've never, ever heard anybody say. Hiring salespeople is really easy. <laughs> <laughs> Our hiring good salespeople is really easy. Yeah. So yeah. I'd encourage you to go check out uh, the services of Yvonne and uh, Results Driven Leadership. Listen, thanks again for today. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll talk to you all again soon.